Are we live? We are live. Cool. Cool. Alrighty. Well, welcome back, everyone, to the stream. Today I will be working in Code Academy, learning some more about JavaScript and Phaser. Uh, the last time we were here, we looked at how to implement JavaScript objects and how to use those, um, how to sort of build our own methods, um, how to build uh, getters and setters, and everything that had to do with JavaScript objects. Today we'll be working on a cute little game, it's kind of in the Pokemon style uh, turn-based game, called Electric Mouse. Yes. Um, <laughs> in this, they've and built in quite a bit of the functionality already, and they've built in uh, the backgrounds and the character animations. Uh, but what, we're, what we'll be doing is basically making it so that all of the buttons appear and they work, and the animations appear as we click the buttons, um, and building out and referencing different objects that they've already built in. So let's get started. If you want to catch up on any of this, um, all of the videos that I've been doing for JavaScript will be posted on YouTube. Um, same channel name, Noctophonics. You can go on there and search through everything that we've done so far. But let's jump right in to today's game. All right, electric mouse. Let's combine our knowledge of objects to finish building a game that pits our electric mouse against the psychic hairless cat and its owl minions. The premise of this game is that there are two characters battling each other. The player is an electric mouse, and the computer is the psychic hairless cat and its owl minions. Before the player can fight the psychic hairless cat, the player must beat three owl minions. The player and computer will simultaneously choose one of three moves. Attack, defend, and special attack. The result of the selections are then displayed on the screen. We will be working in one file called gamescene.js. Um, you'll be using a game state object to store the state of the game. And so what they're referencing here, they've got a bunch of files, um, things for when the end screen appears after you've won or lost, uh, things like the start scene, which we're seeing now, it's just like the welcome screen. Um, other things like the index, which is just the HTML to actually display the canvas um, that you're using, and then the game, which is to uh, configure your game window on the canvas that you've made with the HTML. But we don't have to worry about any of that today, we're just going to be working in the game scene uh, file. And then for some of the, like, they'll have little bits of, of challenge questions at the end. I might, uh, I might switch over to the end scene and add something there, but we'll get to that. For now, we'll just be working in the game scene. And then they set the game state object, I believe that is in the create, yeah, the create uh, function there. Um, hold on a second, let me close a window. As soon as we start streaming, then they've got a mow outside, right? Um, okay. <laughs> uh, all right, so in the game state, we'll keep track of all our states and our characters, buttons, and text information. That's where it will be held. We get a sneak peek at sprite and animation creation using phaser syntax, and we'll also have to build out the logic for our attack and defend buttons. Can you beat them all? Um, so first step, look over the code to see what's already provided in game scene. And we have the game state object, which we found. Um, although I guess this is game state .opponent. So we need to find, I don't see it at the top there where it's in the preload. This is basically just starting, starting the scene um, using a constructor function uh, to start the game scene. We don't have to know exactly what that does for now, but we just know that it, it populates the game and, and allows us to add things to the canvas. Um, Preload adds in all of our PNGs, um, so the characters and the character animations. Um, and let's see here. So we got a lot of those. Got all of the owl minions. Game state dot opponents is the first time I see game state, but I don't think it's referenced there. I think that's just, or I don't. It's not started there. It's not initialized. Um, I guess you don't have to, you might not have to initialize game state because that's sort of a pre-built pre, pre -built 
object. I think that's the case where you just have game state as a pre-built object and then you can reference that and add things to it. Um, so in this case, they're adding the opponents and then adding in all the opponent names and the keyframes for those. Uh, let's see, what else do they want us to look at? So these values will be later added to the create method of the game scene class. Okay, so we have the game state object with various properties and most of the values of, and most with values of empty objects. Okay. Um, in the game scene class, we also, so with the classes, I think what they're referencing is just like this, right? The very first line of code here that we see, um, they're initializing the game scene as a class, which they haven't actually covered that, but it's just a collection, essentially collection of, of data types. Um, so in, in the game scene class, we've also loaded the image assets for you. That's everything within the preload. It's all of our character um, sprites. We've created enemy objects. Yes, that is also, also partly in the preload, but then partly here um, where they're referencing the names of them and then their animations. Um, in the preload, you can actually see like how many frames each, uh, each character has, each sprite has. Um, added clickable buttons in the game. Let's see where those are. Clickable buttons. It'll be something like this pointer on, ah, there we go. Yeah, so they have some of these, anything that says like pointer up will be um, to be used as a button for the mouse. Um, it's like as you, as you click it, um, then it runs the code block underneath. Okay, and then provided a helper function to update the wave of enemies. So I guess that's underneath, it's underneath the update. So update is literally just this one line of, of this function of wave check. I think wave check is actually one of the helper functions. Um, and that checks to see, looks like like what the enemy's health is at and then what to do if it hits zero. Okay. You still have to create the player object and manipulate that and other game objects if you want to battle the psychic hairless cat. I do want to battle the psychic careless cat. <laughs> all right, so the first step was just to look over all the code and see what we could gather from that. Um, now let's get coding. So the create method is where we will create game objects that we want to use in our game. One critical object that you need to update is game state dot player, which currently has the value of an empty object. Update game state dot player so that its value is an object with the following properties. Um, name with a value of electric mouse, health with a value of 45, and frames with a value of an empty array. Okay, so here, once again, I didn't see, let me search for it. I'm not sure if I was seeing um, if they actually had put in here the game state. Let me see where the first, first time we see that is. And this is just like searching with, with control F in the code editor. Okay, that was interesting. Yeah, so I don't see like, um, let me see what the game does at first. Let's see what it actually, yeah, it's just a black screen for now. Um, character objects, I guess we can just start it right underneath the create, just do um, game state dot player. Yeah, because game state is basically a global object that you can access anywhere um, and then add, add properties to it. So one critical object you need to update is the player. So that's value is an object with the following properties. So we need to create an empty object and assign it. So equal sign um, and then contain it within brackets and do our key value pairs, um, name, colon. They wanted electric mouse here. I guess we'll do a capital E there, electric mouse. Separate your key value pairs with a comma and go down to health. This would be set to 45 and frames, which is set to just an empty array, so just a pair of brackets. Okay, good so far. Um, let's see if that initializes the mouse. And not yet. Okay, not yet. If you save your code and try to play the game, you'll see both Electric Mouse and the first Owl. Remember, the enemy sprites are also provided for you. Oh, well, we did not see that. So something 
something is off here. So game state dot player. Um, underneath the create method, we have electric mouse. Let's make sure our spelling is correct on everything. Um, so that'll matter in the references. Health is 45, frames is set to an empty array. Everything looks good. Let's reset that one more time. Let's try to save the code again. Yeah, it's not, not liking that. Okay, so what do we have here? Mstate.opponents. That's set up in a similar way. Game state dot player. Just really taking care to see that my syntax is correct. Name electric mouse. Yes, health forty five frames. I don't know. We'll move on. We'll move on. See if it works after the next step or two. Um, but right now we do not see a thing. We do not see any of our enemies or players, it's just a black screen. All right, so our frames array will contain the animations for our characters. We will create four new objects inside frames for each animation. Each object has a key of key and the respective values are player idle, player attack, player defend, player special. We'll use each one of these objects to play different options in our game. Okay, so basically we are editing this portion. Um, we're going to create four new objects within the array. So inside of our brackets, we put braces and the first one, or I guess for all of them, it's going to be key as the key. <clears throat> I'm not sure why they don't do like the destructive or what are you, destructuring, the destructured version of this where you just have the key be the same name as the value. Um, if they're all just gonna be named key, I don't know what the reasoning is for that, but um, we'll go ahead and add another object here. So each one of these, yeah, um, I'll just do it on a separate line. So key, this is going to be a player attack. Oh, and these all need to be strings, right? It's because these aren't referencing variables, they're referencing um, strings. Let's do player idle. Another comma, my, my tabbing is off, but whatever. We'll do another object here. This will be key player defend. Player defend. And make sure to separate each of these with a comma or else it will not run. Although at the moment it's not running anyway. Uh, player special. Okay, and I think that's the proper syntax. You put the, the braces inside of the arrays and then you let the arrays close it out. And then the parent object um, closes out with its brace. I think that's the same way that they have it in the opponents that they set up for us. It looks like they wait until the end of each set, like of each array, um, and then start a new object. Okay, yeah, that looks looks symmetrical. So we'll go ahead and go with that um, and see if we get any. Yeah, see, I'm I'm concerned because uh, I kind of want to reset the workspace and see what happens. Um, because we're literally only on the second step and we're not seeing anything. So I don't know if something got deleted because I did like, I refreshed before. Can we clean up the code? Format, format code. Let's just reset it. We only did two steps. Reset that, see what happens. Okay, so it does start with a blank screen. Um, hmm. Well, let me try this again. Let me go back to step one and reinitialize um the game state so we did step one let's do step two game state dot player currently has the value of an empty object i briefly took a look at this before the stream and i got the first couple of steps going so i'm not sure what's up now but we'll go ahead and do game state dot player and have it equal to an object with those key value pairs um these I believe are referencing like the preloaded stuff. So whatever, yeah, electric mouse, right? Yeah, so it's it's referencing this sprite. Um, okay, health would then be 
value of 45 and frames would be a value of an empty array. Unless you need the semicolon at the end of that, I'm not sure. Ah, it's still just a blank screen. Do we? Yeah, we saved the code too. Strange. What am I missing here? What is what does the hint say? You can assign GameState.Player to a new object. GameState.Player equals name, health, and frames. Or you can even assign the different properties and name them separately, like name electric mouse and do that. Well, we've got that started. Hmm. Very strange. Yeah, the last time I did this, once it started there, and it would start in the player as well. Set that player. So this is in the proper place, yes? Name 45 frames, nothing. <laughs> yeah, because I remember when I started this before, there was like a game state object at the top, and there's nothing, just setting everything up globally. Although you don't need that if it's already, it's already there. I don't know. Maybe you do need like, um, just an initialization of the object, but I don't think you should. You should just be able to create like whatever new object you want by saying whatever the name of it is, and then add a property to it. Um, I'll try that though. I'll try it like just as a global game state. Um, let game state equal empty object. I don't know if that will work on like above the class declaration. I don't think it will. We'll go ahead and try that though, and see if that changes anything. Yeah. Okay. That's weird. That's really weird. Um. Yeah. It like, like when I reset the progress, it also deleted the the variable declaration at the top, which wasn't something that I put in, it's something that they put in. Um, anyway, okay, cool. Moving on, we'll, we'll redo the frames uh, declaration that we were doing before. So just add in key value pairs, everything with a key of the word key, um, player idle, and separate these into separate objects. I don't think you need the comma there. You need it after each object, right? Um, that key of this is going to be player, player attack. This will be key of player defend. And lastly, this will be key of player special. Okay, let's go ahead and save that, see what we see. Okay, still the same. We see our, our little electric mouse, our pink Pikachu, um, and then an owl, an interesting looking Hutu, or Hutut. Um, or a knocked owl. We'll use, okay, so then for the images we will be using for our characters will be taken from a sprite sheet. A sprite sheet contains multiple frames, each with a different image. We can animate these images by playing them in quick succession to appear like a picture is moving. For example, ah, yes. So we see the little Cody character there um, is moving along based off of his sprite sheet. To animate electric mouse, we will need to insert two more properties inside of each object of the frames array. Create two more keys called start and end and set the value for each animation is followed and then they give us a little chart. Okay, so let's go ahead and add that in. So within each of our properties of frames, we need to add these, or within each of our objects within frames, we need to add properties for the frame start and end. So let's do start. This is going to start at zero for the idle, and then it's going to go to two for the end. 
to. I'll go ahead and just copy this down and add it into here, and then we'll just change the frames that we have. So this will start at three and at four, and then for the defend it is five and six. And for the special, it is seven and eight. Okay, so that should be everything we need for those animations. Hey, we got a little little dancing mouse there. Little pink Pikachu is doing a little tap dance. Sweet, the owl's not moving yet. I'm sure we'll initialize that in a moment. Um, cool. All right, so if you look below, you'll see the rest of the objects for the opponents have been created. Three for the different owl variations. Owl, red owl, blue owl, and a slightly larger psychic hairless cat object. We will use GameState.Computer to keep track of the current enemy on the screen. So to start, below the GameState.Opponents array, assign GameState.Opponents 0 to GameState.Computer, since that will be our first enemy. Okay, so within, with our opponent assigned, saving your code will show both sprites in their idle animation. So basically, this object, the computer object, is the current enemy, and therefore it will reference the, the current animations within that enemy. Right now it doesn't know where to look, so we'll go ahead and do that underneath um, the opponents, which is quite large, the opponents array right here. So we'll set up this property of game state to game state dot computer equals game state dot opponents with a zero index and that will set our owl animation oh cool okay so now the owl is also dancing <laughs> very synchronous enemies uh, we also somehow had our buttons pop in. Um, I don't think that's the way that they they need to be for, or they were designed to be. I don't remember them being vertical, but um, <laughs> sure, well, that'll write itself in the next few steps. But we've got our animations working out. All right, using four each to create our sprites and play the animations. Uh, we've already added our player and enemy objects, so let's talk about how Phaser implements animations. After we created our initial sprites, you will notice three for each methods under the comment create all of the player animations. So is that under create initial sprites? Ah, okay, so create, create all player animations. So it's this one, it's like the for each player frames for each, yeah, I believe it's that one, and then there's also the the one for the opponent there as well. Okay. The first for each method is for the player's animations, and it is followed by a nested for each for the opponent's array and subsequent animations. There's some phaser syntax in the method, but the major thing you need to notice is the section here. This animins, or anims create. Okay, so that is here. And for us to create the animations in phaser, we have to create each one separately. Therefore, we use for each to iterate through our array, which contains the necessary information, like the name of the sprite, the frame key, which frames to start and stop, etc. And include it in the phaser method, this animins, animins create. Uh, we'll explore more of this in our phaser exercises. Okay, so all that we need to know now is this is where the animations are initialized, right? Um, that is step six, just realizing that this is what this block of code is doing. It's iterating through each of the frames and then having it populate um, or generate, it says down here, generate the frame numbers from the start to the end. Cool, pretty, pretty neat and tidy. Creating the informational objects. So locate the comment, add your information text and styling below. Below that create an object called style. We're going to use this object to store properties that will style our text. Use the chart below to give style the following properties, its font, its fill, and its padding. So we need to see, add your information in styling below. 
information in health bars, helper functions, it's not there. I wonder if it's just information in health bars, right? Actual animation. Yeah, because then we just have our object there. So I, th I think it's right here. It's not verbatim what they said the comment would be, but I think that's correct. We can go ahead and search for that though. Let's see if add, uh, add your, no, yeah. Okay, so just right underneath here, underneath our, looks like our attack button sprite. Once after that's loaded in, um, then we'll add our information here. So we need to add a style object, create that. So let style style equal an object with three properties. Uh, font is the first key. This is gonna be Helvetica, 16 pixel Helvetica. Second, we're gonna have our fill of just hashtag with three, okay, so it's just gonna be black, right? Um, so a string and then number six zeros, I believe, one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's the hex hexadecimal code padding of, this almost looks like an object within itself, but it has X of six and then Y of seven. That's interesting, I wonder how how that works, how that unpacks itself there. Okay, so we did that, let's save our code there. Let's see, so our buttons are still vertical, I don't know, maybe they, maybe it changed, maybe they did want it to be that way, but last time I remember this, it was horizontal. Uh, to add text in our game, we'll use the phaser method, this add text, which takes four arguments. The X coordinate um, position in the game, the Y coordinate, the initial text string and an object containing style information, which we just created. Add the text for what the player's choice uh, is by assigning game state dot player move the value of calling this dot add text with the arguments 65, 140, empty string and style. So underneath our style object, we'll go ahead and add this into uh, game state dot player move. Game state dot player This, this is going to equal this dot add dot text. And within that, within those parentheses, we're gonna have our four arguments. The first is going to be the X coordinate. The second is going to be the Y. This is just where we want the text to appear and what style we want it to be in. Our style we created, uh, which is interesting because, um, yeah, it's interesting. So you can basically just create an object have it store all of your your font and color data and then um, yeah just add it in add it in as text anywhere you want on the screen it's kind of handy all right so step eight similarly we want to display our text for the computer's decision set game state dot computer move to store a text object located okay so this is essentially the same kind of code but we're doing it for the computer move instead um, so underneath this line, we'll go ahead and put game state dot computer move. And this equals, what does this equal? This equals the same thing. So it's going to be this dot add dot text. And then we have 320, 140, empty string. The, the empty string is just essentially saying what you want it to say. We haven't decided that yet, but I guess there are helper functions to decide that for us. Okay. Still nothing's changed on the screen yet, but I believe that's correct. We also want to store information into game state dot information. Okay, so same thing. Same syntax that is. Game state dot information. This is going to equal this dot add dot text. And this one's going to be at 140, 80 empty string in style. Okay. Lastly, game state dot player dot health bar and computer health bar 
uh, display the text of electric mouse and set the current and the current enemy in the style of HP number where number is replaced with the actual value. To get the health value of these objects, we need to access these properties, gamestate.player.health and gamestate.computer.health. For example, electric mouse starts with an HP of 45, so our game should render HP 45. Use your knowledge to add in the text for both player and computer that will use the coordinates 45 and 45 for the player and 30, 375 and 45 for the computer. Display the correct text and use style to style the text. When you save your code, you should see the text appear above the characters. Okay, cool. So let's think through this backwards. So we want to add text in, like a this.addText, but we also need to access these properties. So um, let's see. Display the text of text for both player and computer. So we want to say that we want to assign these two, right, the, the health bars um, to be like we did before. So it's going to be, let me start one. Let me start one down here. So game state, um, we'll do the player health bar health bar, this is going to equal this.add.text. Within this, we're going to have 45 and 45. The text, however, is not going to be empty like we did before. It's going to be HP. And then we want to access the property that gives us the actual value of the health, which is stored in game state. Um, GameState.Player.Health. We'll want to wrap this in um, I guess you would just do it yeah, with concatenation. You would just have a space and then a plus there like that. Um, and then it should show, yeah, that should access the property there. We don't need the extra um, quotation mark there. So HP that and then we need our style at the end. So it'll be the same font as everything else. Okay, so I think that's what we want for the health bars. We can go ahead and copy this down and then just play it, change it to computer health bar. Computer health bar. And then change this to computer.health, right? That should be all that we need for those two lines. Okay. When you save your code, the text should appear above them. Okay, it does appear, but it's in the same place because we did not change our X and Y coordinates. So let's go ahead and change the coordinates for the enemy health bar. Um, and then that will separate the values. So it's at the same Y coordinate, but the X value changes. Yeah, okay, cool. So we've got our enemy hit points and our hit points. Um, player has 45 and the owl has 10. Okay. To the logic for our move buttons. Our character and informations and information are created so we can focus on our attack and defend buttons. Note the code for special attack is provided for you to reference if need be. But we should review the game logic before writing any code for implementation. The way our game works is by comparing the player and the computer choices. The player choice is decided by what button is clicked, and the computer choice is decided by a pattern. Um, or sorry, but decided by a random number. The outcomes are based on the following pattern, similar to rock, papers, paper, and scissors. Attack beats special attack. Whoever chooses special attack in this situation loses hit points. Uh, defend beats attack. Whoever chooses attack in this situation loses HP. And special attack beats defend. If both players select the same choice, then both will receive total damage. Or when both defend, nothing happens. Use this nifty chart to reference the outcomes. <laughs> Okay, cool. So that's the logic. We're basically doing a rock, paper, scissors, but in the style of, of Pokemon with these three three moves. Okay, so in the callback function of gamestate.attackbutton.on, locate the conditional input.enabled. Att 
attack button on. So it's right underneath where we were working before, right here, line 233. So pointer up. Okay, so input dot enabled. This is where we want to look. Inside this condition, we'll create a variable called random move, which will be the random choice of the computer. We can use the math random to obtain a random number. And if multiplied by three, then random number will only be between zero and two. The random number will have a decimal point though, so we should wrap math random with a math floor to generate an integer. So first we need to um, create a variable called random move. <clears throat> and then have our math.floor, wrap that around a math.random. And then multiply this result by three. And that way it'll give, and then it will truncate the value and make it, even if it was like 2.99, the math.floor method just eliminates the decibel completely. It just completely truncates that and um, just gives you the integer. So in this case, since we're um, finding a value between uh, zero and three, the math.floor will make it always either zero, one, or two. All right, we got that. And that'll be our computer choice. With our random move variable created, we have the computer's random choice. Zero represents attack, one represents defend, and two represents special attack. Now we need to determine what will happen based on what the random number is. Create a control structure such as if else uh, to execute the code depending on which random choice was selected. Remember that we are working on the attack button. So each of these conditions will be based on the player um, as choosing attack. Uh, if the player chooses attack and the computer also chooses attack, random move equals zero, and we should subtract one from both the player and the computer's dot health property. Okay, so um, we're basically going to create another conditional within this. Um, if random move equals one, so we'll handle, or sorry, is equal to zero, not one, is equal to zero, then essentially the computer chose attack. We're assigning attack to the, the number zero. Uh, within this, we should subtract one from both the player and the computer's dot health property. So like we accessed up above, we're just gonna call it from game state. I think a game state will work. I don't think we need to put this here, um, the this keyword. So game state .player health, and have this be just like since it's just by one, we can do minus minus, right? Um, or we can do minus equals. Uh, for other things, we'll just do the minus minus there. And then this is also going to be the same for the computer health. Um, so game state dot computer dot health minus minus, just iterate it down. Um, okay, I think that's everything in step 13. We need to also display what move was chosen by the computer and the player. Player.move and, and computer move are objects created using phaser methods to display text, which display an empty string um, at the moment. So phaser also offers a handy way to update the text by accessing the dot text property of both the player move and the computer move and assigning a new string. Oh, cool. Yeah, so you just do dot text and then you change it that way. In this case, both electric mouse and the computer choose to attack. So the text in game should display something like attack for both objects. Okay. So yeah, just add in that. So game state dot player, player move dot text equals, um, tackle and then for the computer dot computer move whoop, computer move dot text equals also tackle <laughs> okay After we have subtracted our health and our health bars, we will need, um, or our, 
Subtracted the health, our health bars we will need to update the changes from, from our health. There should be a word there. Update the text of the player health bar and the computer health bar to the current value of the player.health and computer.health. Keep the HP portion of the string. So for this, I think you can just access the text property from the health bars. So the next couple lines are going to be uh, game state uh, dot player health bar and then dot text to access the text property. We want it to equal yeah, just the current state. So basically we have the same code as we had up above for the, the text. Um, so we're going to just copy that down. It's just going to be the HP plus the variable of the um, player health, which is now set. Um, this one has been subtracted from that. Okay, and then it'll be symmetric to the computer health. Computer health bar dot text. This is also going to equal the same as we had up above. Um, but now the property of, of health has changed. So it'll just update that like so. Okay. After updating the health bars, the information text should also be changed to show what happened as a result. Assign a new string to gamestate.information.text that tells the player both electric mouse and the current enemy lost one HP. All right, so lastly in this, gamestate.information. Um, dot text um, this is going to equal just for simplicity's sake both lose one HP um, for this you know I might create like two two different information uh, updates have one like appear above the the mouse's head and have the other one appear above the enemy's head um, but that's basically how you would do it you just create another another object, um, another like information to or whatever inside of game state and then um, create it like we did up here. Create like game state dot information to and then just place it above um, the opponent's head. But for now, this is just going to like appear in the middle. So we still need to play the animations for, whoa, what did I do? Oh, I, I, put, a, I put a comma and not a, um, not a semicolon. Let's try that again. Yeah. <laughs> Mind your punctuation. All right, we still need to play the animations for the player and the computer. Our sprite animations are also in game state, in our game state object, and we can call the phaser.play method with a string to play an animation based on the keys we defined above. Cool. Starting the electric mouse's attack animation, call the player attack on game state player.sprite.anims. Um, notice that player attack is the key of the animation we called earlier or recreated earlier yeah yeah so right at the beginning they had us create create a um, global object um, just the player object and then we have each of these different values for that access the different sprites um, and it also shows like what what frames each of those are contained in so we'll go, to, go back down to what we had with our attack. Um, so at the bottom of this, underneath our information, we're going to access the player animation. The way we do that, game state dot player dot sprite dot anims um, dot play. And then we do in do a player attack this also has to be within a string. That's how we set it up before. Okay, and I believe before even looking at the next one, this one is then going to be from the computer's perspective. It's going to have the computer attack, right? Computer. But I'll wait. I'll wait a second on that um, syntax there. Okay, cool. So playing the computer attack in animation is different since we need to access the dot name of the current enemy and then appending attack to it. So call the game state dot computer sprite uh, with the concatenated string of computer dot name 
and attack to play the correct animation. All right, so this one's a little more complex because it's there's multiple enemies, so we can't just say like enemy attack, right? It has to be the name of the thing and then attack. Um, they're stored. They're stored a little bit differently, individually wrapped, as it were. Play. We want to do. So the variable, which is the reference of game state dot computer computer dot name, and then this is going to be added to the string of attack. Okay. Looking good. Add an else if statement that checks if the random move is one. This means that the computer should choose to defend. Ah, okay, so now that we have all of our functionality for the one the one choice, right? That's that's if the computer chooses to attack back. Um, the random move of zero. Now we need to do for random move of one and then random move of two, and then basically have the same everything's gonna be the same except um, well, not everything's going to be the same. <laughs> there are going to be changes to every line except for these two. These two are going to stay the same for the whole time, like the, the update of the HP. But the rest is going to change. Let's go ahead and add in the else if. Um, so this is if random move equals two, or sorry, if it equals one. And let's go ahead and put this in. I'm going to go ahead and copy it all down though. Because all of our references are going to be the same. We're going to access all of the same properties, but what happens to those is going to be different. So then for if the computer defends, the outcome should be that we display the selection, the mouse loses one HP. So the mouse loses one, but the computer does not lose any. So we can actually delete this line for the defense. Um, and then the player still chooses tackle, but this one is like, um, like harden or something, even though it's an owl. Um, like uh, pr protect, how about that? Protect. Um, these two are going to be the same. These are just health updates. Except this one can be deleted because the computer health is not changing. This one is going to be player. Player loses one HP. Also, we can access like the player name. Um, so game state dot player dot name, which is going to be electric mouse. Um, add that to the string of loses one HP. The animation is still going to be attack for the or the player, but the computer is going to have uh, his defend animation playing. All right, so I think that's all for the defense. And yeah, for, for things like this, um, things that are very symmetrical, where it's just the difference of like a rock, paper, scissors game, it's kind of kind of nice to have, um, to be able to just copy all of the references that you have, and then just change the specific outcomes for each. Lastly, we're going to add in our result if the computer chooses to use his special attack, uh, the third option. So this, I'm just gonna put as else because the only possible options are zero, one, or two. So you don't even have to put in else if random move equals is equal to two um, because that's the only other possibility. So just put in an else there. Um, this is going to have the same functionality. It looks like for this one, the enemy loses five HP if it chooses to special attack when the mouse is attacking. So the mouse doesn't actually lose anything. So we can get rid of the player line. Uh, we can also get rid of the player update to the health because it's not losing anything. It is not changing. This is going to be minus equals five. Um, and then the computer move dot text. Uh, let's just say like uh, aerial attack, aerial ace. How about that? Aerial ace. Um, 
Of course, it's not like, it, yeah. <laughs> Aerial Ace would be much better than losing, resulting in losing 5 HP, but whatever. We're, we're going with that. All right. Um, both lose one. So this is going to be computer, and we have to add in. So computer loses 5 out of space and before that. So it will add in. Uh, once we add in the game state dot computer dot name. And then add that to the string of loses 5 HP. Loses 5 HP. Um, okay. Player attack is going to be the same. This one, I believe, is just called special. Special. So when you're accessing the computer animation, it's just special, not special attack. Okay, let's save that. Let's see how it works. Let's see if we got our attack button working. Woohoo! Yep. Sweet. All the animations are playing. We've got the update of what each character chose. Um, we've got the update of what happens as the result of those choices. And then we've got the, the hit points updating as well. What happens if it goes to... Yeah, see, and we even have the, the name of characters there. The owl has fainted. Negative four. Oh no, it froze! Yeah, so it doesn't know how to switch between characters yet um which is weird because i thought they had built all that in for us the other thing that's weird is these these vertical buttons in the finished game they have an example of it they're not vertical they are horizontal i don't know that happened when we were adding the animation for the owl which is very weird the owl animation popped in but then so did the buttons so that's tied together somehow i don't know and our defend button isn't working. Does our special attack work? Special attack does not work. Nope. Okay, so just, yeah, just the attack button works at the moment. But once you, once the owl faints, then it freezes. It doesn't know what to switch to after that. Um, okay. Just that wave check. Um, oh, you know, that I think this is totally... Okay, we'll finish the defend button, and then we'll troubleshoot that. I'm pretty sure I know what the issue is with that. Um, I think we have to add in a property at the beginning so that when it checks the wave, so to speak, it checks if the opponent has fainted, it will bring in the next opponent. But let's go ahead and finish our defend button. Um, so as you can see, this is the same as what the attack button was um, before we started. So we're gonna add the same functionality, except um, the exchange of health is going to be different. So let's actually just copy literally everything that we had here. Okay, Code Academy just reloaded. Let's scroll back down. And is this the this is the attack button? So we need the let random move. So copy every, well, not that much, not that much. Copy everything down to the brace there, I believe. Or no, I guess we don't need that, but we don't need that one. We just need all of this. Copied into our defense logic. Yeah, so let random move equal, making sure that we have everything Oh, we do need another, yeah, we did need another brace there because we had another conditional. Let's go ahead and add that in for that. Close that off. All right, so now we can edit the specifics of this. So this is if you, as the player, click defense. All the random moves are gonna be the same, so zero is attack, one is defense, and two is special for the computer, but this is as if you click defend. So if the computer selects attack, the computer should lose one health as the player defends. So for the first option, first result, computer loses one. Uh, so we can get rid of nothing happens to the player's health. We can get rid of those lines. Um, computer text what the choice was. Uh, defense curl. And then the computer move was attack player defend is going to be here
play the animation for the defense, and then it will play the animation for the attack. Um, and for the information, we'll update this as the gamestate.player.name loses one HP, same as we had down there. So game state dots or sorry not player computer computer dot name plus loses one HP. So make sure to put in that little space before so that when you concatenate it, it will not smush the word loses and the name together. Okay, I think that's good for the first result, which is attack for the computer. Second result. Um, if the computer defends, I don't think anything happens with this one. Yeah, neither character takes any damage. So we can literally just eliminate, yeah, eliminate the health properties. We're not updating those at all here. And I think, uh, well, let's see. For the information text, we can just put in like um, a tumbleweed blows by or crickets or something, right? Because nothing, nothing's happening. Um... So let's just put in a tumbleweed rolls by, floats by. <laughs> da, da, da. Okay. Player attack. This is going to be defend once again. Defend. And the computer chose to defend as well. Else, okay, our last option here, if the computer chooses to use the special attack, then the computer should do four damage to the player. So it breaks through that defense curl and does four damage to the player. So this is going to need to be changed to player. Player.health. Subtract four. Um, player move. Defense curl. And also, I forgot to change it up here. Girl. And the computer move is going to be the same. Computer health doesn't change, but the player health does. Um, we'll go ahead and add the. We'll just grab that from up here. Player health. Uh, not that one. Oh, we removed it from both. I'll just grab it from up above. Player health bar. I'm just going to update based off of this. And just replace that computer one with this. Oh, that was the wrong place. Hold on. Lost my place. It's down here. Right there. Okay. If the computer does not lose 5 HP, the mouse does. So player.name loses 4 HP. Player defend is going to be the animation. And the special is what the computer does. All right, and just like whoops, just like that, we have our defense button made. Now, if we play the game and choose to defend, we see the little animation, right? And see, it is a defense curl. He's like he's curling up there, not with his tail, but he's just curling up. Um, so everything's updating. We have the move appearing above their heads. We have the result of the choices up above with their respective names and the animations for each. Protect a tumbleweed floats by. Once again, I think if we go all the way to the end of this, which the, the mouse is still winning, even though, oh, now he's not. Let's see if we just defend the whole time. What's the strat? Do, do we defend? A tumbleweed floats by. Yeah, the owl has made it. So once the owl faints, eh, nothing happens. Um, but hey, we got we got the first enemy working. All right, locate the conditional inside game state dot defend button dot on callback function like you did for the attack button and create another random move. Oh, I see. So what we just did, they're like outlining here below. Um, they kind of break it apart into what we just did for the attack button. Um, but the first, the first uh, instruction, the first um, check mark here was for. It's like a condensed version of that, and then they extrapolate from there. So, 
Um, these, I think it's all the way down to pretty much the end. Yeah, we did all of that. Um, but that's just a more thorough explanation or a thorough walkthrough of what, what we just did to um, take the functionality of our attack button, copy it over into our defense, and then just change the values of what we wanted to display. All right, great job. Our buttons are now completed and we should now be able to play our game. Each button should trigger a computer choice which will be reflected in the properties in game state. Our wave check helper function will insert the next character to be versed when we have defeated an enemy. That is not currently working, so I think I know what to do. Try playing a game against the computer and see if you can beat the psychic hairless cat. Well, we've got to get to the psychic hairless cat first. So, theoretically, we have everything we need for... Um, oh, that's weird. No, the special button is not... Yeah, that's not built out. So that, that deleted too. Um, okay, well, let's... Uh, Let's add that in. We've got to add in our special button functionality. Uh, before we do that, I want to jump into seeing if we can get the enemies to switch out after they fainted. So let's do... Yeah, so this wave check here, this is what does it for us. Because it looks to see if the computer health is less than or equal to zero. And then it changes this wave count property. Um, it increments that wave count is not equal to that so it looks like there needs to be a wave count property as well as a wave check method inside of that this dot wave check so this is accessing the game state like i said when we restarted this like reset it um it like eliminated the entire game state object so let's just add in a method of or we don't need to add in a method because that's the helper function. What we need to add in is the um, is the property it's accessing. So this this is looking to the helper function. And then it accesses the property of wave count. I think that's the only thing missing the weird thing is that it was it was everything else worked like information worked computer worked player move worked even though we haven't initialized that within an object we initialized that essentially when we assigned the property um the thing is like wave check doesn't have that it's just a function it's just like a helper function um so i don't know that wave count exists yet because there's no assignment of that um but it's just within the main game state. So we're just going to set that to zero. Um, so just the key of wave count. Wave count, this is going to be set to zero. I don't know, was that... Let me go back to the bottom here. Oh, where's the... Wave count plus plus, yeah. Let's literally just try that and see see what happens. To attack. Yes, okay, cool. That's all that needed to be done. So the only thing that was not initialized, this is cool because it's like being a detective, right? Um, so within the game state object, everything else was initialized uh, within the code itself where it was just assigning with an equal sign those values. So it was populating the game state object. But the wave count is just buried within this helper function so it was never initialized so we just needed to initialize that and now now it's working now when we when we cycle through the enemies or when we make an enemy faint then uh it just the the hp does go negative um yeah yeah, I mean, there's a, there is, you know, of course, a way to change that, but I don't think we'll go to the hassle of trying to do that. But it does go negative for a second, and then it switches over. Um, yeah, instead of having it be like the computer health is less than or equal to zero, we need to say, like, basically to not display. If it's less than zero, we need to just display zero, right? Um, so this conditional is still fine. But the information text, as it stands, it needs to be like, update the health unless it's less than zero and then just populate zero. I think that would be back in where we set up our um, attack and defense 
logic, it'd be like update this, um, where is it? Yeah, this one. So like update this HP value, this would be contained within like a, an if conditional and just say if it is um, like greater than zero, then do this. If it's just equal or less than zero, then just have it equal zero. We could put that in, but it's only there for a half second and it doesn't matter anyway, but that's just how you would do that to change so that it would never display a negative value. Um, okay, so then we have, yeah, just attack there, attack, attack. Let's see if we can get to the psychic careless cat. We haven't even, we haven't even technically completed this yet. Yes, look, the final boss, the psychic careless cat, attack. Just totally, just attack. Nothing but attack. Just tackle the whole time. I think this is the best strat. Best strategy. Woohoo, you won! Yeah, just, the, the key to this game is just never stop attacking. Just keep attacking. <laughs> you will win. Because it was like... Yeah, per perfect. <laughs> that was interesting. That was a... Where is that stored? I saw a little, uh... Perfect. Oh, that's weird, dude. I saw a, a, a text popped up that said perfect, which must mean we didn't lose any health in the last battle. But that was weird because I don't see that anywhere within the code here. So strange. Oh, protect. I, I read that wrong. It was, it was just protect. But yeah, strategy. It's a freaky cat, dude. Just attack, only attack. I think the fastest way to lose would be to defend because if it attacks you with its special attack, um, you won still. We got down to three health, but but yeah, we still won. Okay, so we got our wave check working. We got that working and now we need to program in our special attack logic, um, but both of our defense and attack buttons are working. <clears throat> There is a way to win with just doing defense, but you more than likely will lose the fastest using defense. Um, it's it's <laughs> just because of the way that they have the the difficulty set, or not the difficulty, but like the health exchange set. Um, you have more of a chance, more of a risk if you defend versus attacking, because attacking is like the worst that can happen is you just lose one. Um, but defense is like, you can lose four, special attack is you can lose five. Um, okay, so let's program in our special button. Yeah, our special button logic. Okay, so I'm going to grab this. Everything from let random move down. I'm just gonna do it this way. Control shift down arrow. All the way down to that that bracket, I believe. Yeah. Copy that in. I guess we don't need that one. Yeah. Copy that in to the special button logic. That code block. Okay, so if the computer attacks, right? You're doing your special attack. If the computer attacks, I think the computer actually wins based off of what they did previously. So special attack is only good for defense. It actually loses health. The player will lose like one um, if the computer attacks at this point. So let's just say this is for the, the mouse's special ability. Thunderbolt. And... Um, and then the computer will tackle. The computer health does not update, but the player health does. Player. Okay. Information. This is going to be the player. Player.name loses 1 HP. Um, and this is going to be the player special animation. and attack for the computer. 
good so far. I want to double check that, see if the, so when it was attacking, when the mouse was attacking and the computer chose to use the uh, special ability. Oh, it actually loses five. You lose five if, if it attacks while you're doing your special attack. That doesn't seem right. <laughs> um, okay, we'll put that in five. We'll adjust that later to your to your preference, but that's what they have us put in. Um, so, oh, I, I'm not updating the right thing. Hold on. That's, that's the defense one. We're looking for the special attack right here. Line 299. Switch starts. Okay. Um, this is going to be minus equals five. So yeah, don't special attack because you have a chance of losing five. Don't defend because you have a chance of losing four. Just just attack. Just attack the whole time. No no change in strategy. Okay, so I think all of the first option is good if the computer chooses to attack. Let's move on. If the computer chooses to defend, then the computer actually loses four. Um, because the special attack breaks through the defense. So we'll just copy one of these up to here, change this to computer health, um, computer health, minus equals four. Player move is still going to be the Thunderbolt. Thunderbolt. A tumbleweed does not float by. This is going to be the computer loses, um, five, loses five HP or four, sorry, four HP. Close those uh, quotation marks put in gamestate.computer. Computer.name. And then add that to loses 4 HP. All right, the animation for the player is going to be the special. And the animation for the computer will be defend. Um, yep, we got the information there. I mean, sure, it felt like something was missing, but I think that's all good. Let's move on. So this is if the... Now, we don't know what happens if we have two special attacks, right? They didn't ever tell us that. Two special attacks. Say, like, there's, you know... There's a concussive blast. They both lose two, right? Um, so let's update both. Oops. Let's update both to lose two. So special attack is the most risky because if you, <laughs> it is the riskiest choice. If you, or if the computer chooses to defend, that's that's the only way that you actually don't lose any health. Yeah, if the computer chooses to attack, you lose five. If the computer chooses the special attack, then you lose two. So you might as well just not use the special attack at all. Defense is better because you, you have two options that don't lose health. Um, I think, yeah, you have two options. Um, and then attack is the same. So just attack, just attack. This is going to be Thunderbolt for the special move, electric mouse and aerial ace. We also need to update the computer health in this one. So we need the, um, game state dot computer health. I think this one too, it was the gamestate.computersprite.health? Or was it, no, I think it was just computer, yeah, computer.name loses, or sorry, this is computer, computer.health, there we go. Okay, information text is gonna be both lose uh, two. Both lose two HP. Player special is the animation going to be played from here. And the computer name special. Yes. And this is not going to be the player health bar. This is going to be the computer health bar. Computer health bar. Make sure we did not change that for any of the other ones. It would just it would just flop the values of that. Yeah, like this one. Yeah, so I did do that. I did switch those up. Player.health bar. I was wondering why that went on. It was a little bit longer than the other one. Um, I think everything else is good though. Player.health bar, player.computer.name, yep, 
or computer health bar dot text. Oh, there isn't one here though. We need to update this. So we need to update the computer to have to subtract four from its health there. Your text. This is going to be an updated version of that. The player health updates. The computer health updates, and then both the computer and the player health updates. Okay, I think our special button is done. Let us see here. And use this special attack. Thunderbolts. Yeah, see? It is using its electric power. Wow, look at that. Look at that. Special attack. Red Owl loses four. Red Owl loses four. Both lose two. Maybe not. Maybe the special attack is is the way to go. I mean, we're losing more health, but we're also defeating the enemies faster. See if we can get through the psychic careless the, the psychic careless cat with just uh oh yeah I didn't change the hairless cat's special move it's still aerial ace but whatever it can fly it can psychically fly oh we lost yeah no definitely strat is just attack attack the whole time attack. Yeah, all of our animations are working. I think we actually lost that time. Whatever. Um, okay, so the game is fully functional. Now we can start adding extra functionality, extra things to challenge ourselves. Um, first thing, I don't... I mean, this might be the last thing I look at, but I don't know why. I really want the buttons not to be aligned vertically. <laughs> so um, let's try to find it where where that's being populated, but I won't do that first because that's just kind of boring and it's just literally just changing where the buttons are. Um, let's see what the challenges they have for us are. Tweak the difficulty of the game by deciding your own HP values for electric mouse and or enemies. All right, so some of these I won't necessarily do. I think, you know, <laughs> we could definitely tweak it to be more fair or to be more challenging, however we want. The way that we would do that is to go up to the top here and change first of all the health of the player line 48 the health of the player change this value to whatever we want and that value would be our health for the game we'd have a hundred we could have a million we could do whatever we wanted we could have pi divided by the square root of two anything um anything that's an actual integer <laughs> um Let's see, so then for the opponents, their health is also a property within their object, so you just change that to be whatever you like. You could make the Psychic Careless Cat invincible by just giving it a, a health of a million, and then once you get there, you would never be able to defeat the Psychic Careless Cat. Okay, so that's how you tweak the difficulty by changing your HP values. You could also change the logic of the attack and defense buttons so that attack like only attacking would not be the best um you could change the attack button to be more risky you could change the defense button to actually like if both players defend then you could just heal yourself um so like with the I actually might do that one hp where's the defense we're in the we're looking at the attack right now let's look at the defense yeah so with the tumbleweed floating by this one um if this happens like add add hp like both players get you know five hp added um so game state the game state i mean we're basically yeah we're just adding in a healing possibility for these <clears throat> so put in the computer health and then the player health and both of these will be added to five. So my or plus equals, not minus equals, plus equals five. So if they both defend, they both heal a little bit and then go back to the battle. Um Yeah, oh that that was literally the second I <laughs> maybe I subconsciously 
do that, but change the logic for defend to heal both characters if they both choose to defend. Yeah, so that's how you do that. You just add in the change of health at the top there. Give the electric mouse additional lives at the beginning. Interesting. We'll do that in a second. Edit the styling of the informational text. Okay, so that is stored within the style object that we created here. We created it be like, we could make it be a different color. Um, you could also create multiple styles or if you wanted, I mean, obviously you could create multiple styles, but you could have the color of um, say like the information text be red, but then the color of, um, or sorry, have the information text be black, but then the color of the moves be red or the, um, the health be red or you could even do like we did in the mole unearther game where you have a score subtractor you could do the same thing with with the health and have it subtract um subtract a number and have that appear as red all you need to do is create another style object um let it be like style two or style red or whatever you want to call it and then just change the the fill here the fill is the color so if we change this to like i don't know what is uh what is purple in hexadecimal purple hex code a zero two zero f zero okay so we have a zero two zero f zero yeah so now we have a purple right and everything is going to be purple okay so that's how you change the color um and then if you like i said if you wanted to create multiple styles for the HP and then the results of everything you can change that to um, just create a separate object for those okay creating another move that the player and a computer can do special defense you know that one's going to tie into our button issue um, because we will have to create another button that one might be challenging you create a logic that determines move accuracy so that the computer can miss whoa Whoa, okay. First thing with that, I don't think it's as hard as it sounds. Um, basically, instead of having in the logic for each of the buttons, yeah, so instead of having the math random equal three or be multiplied by three, have it be multiplied by, multiplied by like five and then, or say four, say four. Okay, so this is 25% 25, 25 chance that it can miss. And the way that you would do that, the way that you would code the the miss is just having, instead of this being else, have this actually be else if um, random move equals uh, two. And then at the end of this, and everything is gonna be the same. That's just saying, is before the only other option for that, um, random move was two so else was else was doing the same thing now we have another number that's possible because we are now multiplying by four um, instead of three so with this we can say um, else and this will be our condition if the player misses but right now it's a 25 percent chance of that happening um, and of course you could make it be like in order to decrease that percentage, you can make it be, um, say like 10, right? Okay, say you multiply this by 10. You have the numbers zero through nine. And then, so you can also say that if random move equals multiple numbers for the same action that the computer will do, and that way you're splitting it up a little more, um, not evenly, it was still even before, but you're making it less of a percentage that um, they can miss. So essentially you would have like, if random move equals zero through and create a range, zero through three. And if random move equals four through seven, right? Or four through six. If random move equals seven through eight, and then you just have nine being the one um, as the miss, right? Um, that way it's like only a 10% chance that you can miss and then the rest would be evenly distributed. Um, 
And of course, in that case, it's not even because you're doing one and then dividing. Oh well, yeah, it would still be even because you're doing one and then dividing the nine options into um, into threes. And that way you would have a 10% chance of missing. I'm gonna go ahead and do that. I think it's kind of a fun idea. Go ahead and multiply this by 10. Um, so I don't really know how to do, how to actually do what I'm saying in like a concise way. I know you can put in like, if it's equal to zero. Oh, I know. Yeah, you'd have to put in like an and and then say if it's less than this or if it's more than this. In this case, this one's a little bit easier. So if it's, um, this one is basically if it's less than or equal to three or sorry, two. So that would be the first three options, zero, one, and two. So if random move is less than or equal to two, then essentially the computer has chosen to attack. Um, it's basically going to be like a 30% chance of that happening, a 30% chance of the defense, 30% chance of the special, and then a 10% chance of um, of it missing, or of your your attack, the player's attack missing. This one is going to be um, is greater than or equal to, so greater than or equal to. Three, or we could just say greater than two, right? If it's greater than two, um, or if it's oh, how how do we put this? Because we have to put it like an and. If it's greater than two and it's less than, yeah. So put it at the end of the range. So like, put our and in there, and random move is less than, let's see, so three, four, five, so it needs to be less than six, right? Um, we could put in less than or equal to five, I guess, because five would satisfy both conditions, because it would be equal to five and greater than two. Four would satisfy the conditions because it's the less than five and greater than two. Yeah, that works. So just less than or equal to five. You could just put in less than six, um, like that. You kind of have to put a, this is one quirk with this code editor. If you put it together like this with a less than um, symbol, then it thinks you're trying to create HTML code so that it will change the color of things down here, but you can just ignore that. It'll still work the same. It's just the colors are gonna be off um, and be different. But um, we'll go ahead and do less than or equal to five for that one. That'll satisfy the same condition. All right, so this one, this is for the range of six to eight. Um, so again, like if it's greater than five and it's less than, random move is less than or equal to eight. Okay. And then lastly, we'll put in our else condition, which is basically just saying nine, the number nine, um, which is the 10th option in our zero through nine options of the random numbers. So else, then we'll put in like, um, I guess this is just like you, yeah. See, that's interesting. This is just for, the player's accuracy. So we'd put this in and say like, just the text of, yeah. Um, if the attack misses, then essentially with this, we're saying that the computer doesn't make a move. Um, So like this would just be the attack. The attack missed, right? Um, 
This caps all these, right? The attack missed. Okay, so, but that's assuming that after the attack missed, the computer does not do anything. It just waits until you make another move. Um, we could put in here, like the computer automatically attacks, but we kind of wanted that to be, how would we do it if we want that to be random as well? But anyway, let's let's start with the functionality that we have built in and see if we can get a case where when we attack, we miss. Red Owl loses, Red Owl loses. Both lose. Yeah, it's only a 10% chance, so we'll see if we can get it here. Both lose. Hey, there we go. Okay, cool. Yeah. So 10% chance that this will occur where, oh, we do need to play the, um, the animation too, like the attack animation, but then it will display that the attack missed. Um, and then we could make it, you know, like, a like say, the text up here updates to um, dodged or something for the computer, right? Like the computer just just dodges. It spends its energy dodging the attack versus actually attacking. Um, so let's try that. Let's do tackle and then this is like evade or something, just dodge. There's no animation for that, so it's just gonna look like the owl isn't doing anything. Um, but this is how you would implement it if you had another animation. Let's see if we can get it again. Yeah, well, has fainted. That was quick. <laughs> see if we can get it again. Yes. Okay. Cool. So now the attack missed. This is a dodge. Nothing happens with the HP. They they don't get hurt. Neither one of them gets hurt. Um, you could make it where since the mouse missed and he like crashes to the ground, you could say that. He loses one or or a couple couple health points. Um, but we'll keep it like that. Just when they when you miss, nothing happens with the attack. Um, the way that you would change that with the defense is pretty similar. Um, it's actually exactly the same as far as how you would uh, the logic of it is the same. You would just change the the result. Um, they're like if it just say like the defense failed and then um and then if the defense fails then based off of whatever the computer did you lose a certain amount of health uh, so that's one one way to do it where we make the math random move um a higher value so then we change the probability of each move happening um in our conditionals and we could change that to like 100, right? And then there would be only a 1% chance that the attack misses. And you could change um, that depending on the move. If you had, you know, an array of moves like you do in Pokemon, you could say that Aerial Ace is a 100% chance of making it and there's no no chance of it missing. Um, but other things like Rollout or something have a higher, higher degree of, of chance that it will miss. Now the other way to do this, I guess would be like for the individual state. Um, so to, to sort of nest another conditional within each result and say that if it equals zero, back to what we had, we'll go ahead and look at the defense. So it's not confusing. Um, if random move equals zero, right? If the computer chooses to tackle, then we give that a an accuracy value. Um, we do that by saying, well, by creating another variable saying at the top here, let accuracy, let accuracy equal just like, just the choice between um, one and 10. So like we had up above, we're just separating this out into two variables instead of doing it in one, one step. Um, but this way you would be able to access the accuracy based on each possible 
combination of moves. Um, whereas before, it's just like, okay, the one number is determining everything, um, and the result at the bottom is simply just just a 10% chance that nothing happens. <clears throat> Instead, you would have it be where you can access the accuracy variable within each result. Um, and then depending on that result and the accuracy number, change what happens. So if the the player move um, is, or if the player is trying to defend, if the accuracy is zero, then, um, then the player fails his defense and if the enemy is attacking at the same time, then he loses health. If the player defense fails, but the enemy is defending at the same time, then the computer health goes up, but the player health does not. So you can kind of structure it out like that. Um, that's a little more complex, but but honestly, like once, or maybe it's just a little more coding, right? It's a little bit lengthier. Um, but it's actually a little more straightforward where you're just accessing a variable in addition to accessing the first variable you created. Um, yeah, and that would be cool because in states like that where it's like, you don't lose any health, but your defense failed, so therefore the computer gains health and you don't. Um, creates like another times another um, order of possibilities. Um, yeah, okay. Cool, cool. So what are the other two? Oh yeah, so give additional lives at the beginning. Let's tackle that one next. Um, and I guess I need to, well, this isn't going to affect anything. We can just keep that there, but um, yeah. Okay. So additional lives at the beginning. So we need to create another variable, right? Um, like within this global object is to have lives. Um, lives equal three, right? That would be three. Um, and then we need a conditional that says if mouse health equals uh, zero, then subtract the lives, increment those down, and then like give him 45 again. I don't know where exactly to put that. Um, I mean, it doesn't matter much. <clears throat> Maybe in like the update function, right? The update, have it be in here if, yeah, have it just be like if um, game states, game state dot lives. And this is basically saying if there are lives left, right? Wait a second. I think let's let's analyze the helper functions for a second. Because they'll probably have something like that in here. Else if game state dot player dot health. Yeah, this one. So since we're adding in lives, when game state dot player dot health is less than or equal to zero and um I'll store it, you know what, I'll move that. We, we didn't put it there, but I'll move that um, into the lives equals zero. Then you do this, then you end, end the game essentially. Um, but if not, then we'll add another else if, else if game state dot player dot health is less than or equal to zero. Um, we could put in an and there and say like, and the lives are greater than zero. Um, so that it has to, yeah, it has to satisfy both, right? So game state, I do this as like a ternary operator or something. It feels like, like there's enough similarity. You could make this as one line, but we're gonna do it as two. Um, lives is greater, greater than zero. Um, yeah, so within this, we'll change where lives is in a second. We're just going to put that within the player object. Um, and let's get this, let's get this back on one line. Hold on. <laughs> let's get this back there. There we go. Okay. 
So, if the player health equals zero, but the lives is greater than zero, then lives um, game states dot player dot lives uh, minus minus. Just decrement that by one. And what else? So we want to update the health, right? So game state dot health. See if I can remember that. Game state dot player player health bar equals. I think there was another thing there. It was like text, right? Text equals game state dot player dot health. And this needs to be HP, right? So HP, the colon, that needs to be within quotation marks as a string. And then this needs to be added to it. I believe that will be what we want. <clears throat> okay, so it updates the health. Um, lives decreases by one. Probably wanna create a lives um, text. So we need like, uh, this dot add text, but I think, yeah, just like this dot add text, right? And then have it, I'm not sure. I know 45 was the Y coordinate. So like, I think it was 45 and 45. So we want this to be the same X coordinate. Um, want it to decrease or be lower than the Y. So actually increase the Y. Um, to like 65, maybe 20 pixels below. Since the, the text is 16 pixels high, a padding of, of four, <clears throat> or not four, um, yeah, four. Have the text be lives, and then, or like LP, right? Like life points, life points. Um, and then have this be game state dot player dot lives. Player dot lives. This is also going to be added in. Like so. And then the style is just going to be style. Okay, so those are our four arguments for the this dot add dot text. Um, before we always had this equal to something, we were always setting um, I mean, we could do that. I don't know if we need to though. We can just add the text into there. That might need to go up above, right? And then we need to update that later. Um, I guess we could just populated each time but each time we do that it's going to overlap itself right um yeah so we might need to do that we're gonna we're gonna see how it runs with this but i'm i'm pretty sure that's gonna overlap every time and you're gonna have a stack of of lives so we don't want that let's do, go ahead and see what um how we did that at the beginning So after the frames, player health bar equals this dot add dot text. Yeah, so we just need to create another property and then have it be equal to that. Okay, well, we'll do that then. So let's just do, and let's bring this up to there actually. So then this line will be updating it later. We don't need that to populate inside of our conditional. We need that to be outside of it um establishing the property so right here yeah right here we'll do game state dot life like a life counter equals this and that'll create the property for us um it'll initialize it for us there Oh, 
to get everything aligned there. Okay. Down here, then we can update that. So that's the life the life counter update. Um, or the life counter stores. How do we do this? Oh, it equals game state dot lives, right? So game state. Yeah, because the way they had it with the health bar and the health is it's two two separate properties. The health is what's actually changing, and then the health bar is what's updating to then display on screen. So there's like a someone behind the scenes um, analyzing the situation and then relaying that to another person who's actually displaying that, who's publicizing that, right? It's like the the behind the scenes journalist and then the anchor on on the new station, right? Um, so we'll do game state dot life counter. Um, this is going to equal, and this needs to be life counter dot text and see we created a text file with it. Um, life counter dot text. Let's refresh that for a second. Okay, I guess it refreshed and then it was like the syntax is off. Um, yeah, because we haven't finished it yet. So dot text, we have our string or no, not a string. We just want this to equal game state. Um, oh, I see. Yeah. So this is going to be analogous to the player dot health lines we were writing. Uh, game state dot lives. So we want LP, LP plus game state dot lives. So whatever the current value of lives is, it will update the life counter text with that. All right, now let's save it and see. Oh, no, 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 no. That means we have a syntax error somewhere. No, that's not good. Not good at all. Where does this go? Where does this go? Okay. So far, so good. So far, so good. Man, okay. If it was just in the last bit, dude, why? It looks right. Of course it looks right. Player.lives. Okay, let us let me see up here at the very top. Let's press the home key to go all the way to the top. If we can, maybe not. Home is the opposite, I guess. Lives is a counter of three. Okay, so game state dot lives. Um, is it because game state dot life counter dot text? Where is this one? Is this only? There's two places for that. This dot add dot text. Yep. Style. Yep. Life counter. See, we're initializing all these things here. So it shouldn't be an issue. Let's analyze our conditional a little bit more. Wave check if. Yeah, so that checks if the enemy is fainted. If the wave count is greater than three, yeah, that shouldn't affect anything. Making sure all the braces are matching where they need to be. Where's this one? See, this is weird because it's saying like there's an else and then there's else if, but the else comes before the else if. So this is wrapped in the if conditional there. That's very weird. There's those two, this one, where does this one go? This one goes all the way to the end, yeah. Do we need another brace? Do we just need another brace at the end of that? No, because then the game scene doesn't have one. Okay. Um, wave check is that one. Is that one? They all have pairs. They're all in pairs there. Wait, where is this this one going? Okay, it goes all the way to that one. Okay, cool. Looking at the pairs of braces, seeing if we missed anything there. Okay. Looks good on that on that end of things. So they had an else before the else if that might be the issue. Don't know. Um, 
set timeout game state wave count equals is equal to three. If the wave count is oh, there's another there's another conditional here. Okay. So this is all there is a nested conditional here. It is yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's a nested conditional within that one. This goes to this, and then there's an else if and an else if. Um, player dot lives is greater than zero. Oh right, right, right. I forgot to change where the lives is. The lives is currently should just do things when I'm thinking about them. Okay, so lives. Lives needs to switch from the global game state object into the player object. Um, like so. Where's the where's our player object? Yeah. So I'll do it above frames and after health and just have lives equal three. Now oh, come on, come on, you wanna make it work. Come on. Work. Wave count zero. Lives is three. Game state dot player lives. Look at that, it's three. Why don't you see it? Save. Ref refresh. No. No. Game state dot player dot lives. Game state dot player dot health is less than or equal to zero. Player dot lives. Player dot lives subtract it by one. Where are we going for this one? Where is the initialization of the life counter? Oh, wait a second. Player health bar? No, that's still, yeah. Life counter. So this dot add dot text of the game state dot player dot lives. Right, what happens if we delete this line? Still nothing? Okay. What happens if we delete everything we had on here? What happens if we delete this? Else if. Else if statement. Okay, let's keep deleting things until it reappears. This is annoying. Um... Yeah, it can't be the accuracy thing, right? Because <laughs> that's not referenced anyway. That's just assigning a variable to a number. Um, unless it's something that we were playing around within there. But it wasn't because it was working before that. So it's got to just be the life counter thing. It does not like that. Oh, it is refreshing itself. Refreshing itself. Okay, let's try this again. Um, let's put it back down to here. And do... Yeah. Life counter. We need to eliminate that. From there. Nothing. And now I can't undo because it automatically refreshed itself, so I don't know what happened or what's the issue. Game state is that great? Game state dot player. It's setting up the property. It is setting up the property of lives. Um, just search for where that is. It's only in one place now, yeah, because we deleted the thing else. Um, Game state dot life counter. So this is operating the same way as the health ones. Game state dot player dot lives. But the issue is not with with this. I mean, it could be, but we, that's not what is causing it to uh, throw a reference error. There's something simple, I bet. Something very simple that happened in between us uh, changing the the defense logic, or sorry, the attack logic and changing the lives. Um, it was probably this, probably down here. Probably it just doesn't like that we added in the and statement. Um, of course now it doesn't. OK, 
care. It's like, no. This is no. Is that out is less than or equal to zero? I don't know. Okay, it doesn't. Yeah. <clears throat> no way to know there's no way to know so game state uploaded at lives equals zero Remember that health is less than zero how many times did I reference this just twice should be correct yeah oh did I not have well okay Wave check. I'm trying to return it to its former state because if it knows when. Okay, let's try that. This is how it was before. It had else if game state up there dot health less than or equal to zero. Game scene end scene done. Right, that's the end of everything everything here wave wave check is there this is the end of the pause idle yeah that's there this one's the end of the game scene okay and that's the end of create this is the end of update oh we had a conditional that we didn't do anything with right there we go there it is okay let's undo some of that let's undo this that was fine nothing was wrong with that okay um and then add in our other conditional there. Else if this, then, yep. Okay. And get rid of this. So now within the helper function, if the player health is less than or equal to zero and the lives is greater than zero, um, then the lives will decrease by one. It will update the life point uh, text and then it will update the health text back to what it was, um, which we also need to change that. So game state, game state dot player dot health um, equals 45, right? You just set it back to 45 reassign it 45 and then um I, let's see see no why is it still broken no okay 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 they're not live where, where is this where does this appear you can see that life counter Player dot lives style. Live counter dot text is game state player dot lives, right? Player dot lives is greater than zero. So first it should check, it should see that the player health well, first of all, it should just start, but once it's there, it should say that um, player health is zero. So what do we do with that? Well if the lives is greater than zero, which it is at the beginning. Then you decrease it. It equals two, right? The counter that we set up before, the counter dot text, is then going to be this game state dot player. Oh, dot player dot lives, not dot lives, because that doesn't like, not exist. Dot player dot lives equals that. Please work. Oh my goodness. Player dot lives. Um. Dot player dot lives game state dot player dot lives and then style right and that is working from the player which is here it has the three lives at the top okay so then we establish a life counter game state dot life counter this dot add dot text forty five sixty five Game state style, all good there. We have player.lives 
being greater than zero. I do not know. I do not know the issue. I thought that that broken conditional up here would change it, um, but it did not. Maybe this is it. Just because this isn't else, it's the, it's else if instead. I don't know. Player dot lives game state. Making sure that I spelled all of the words correctly. Health bar text. Yeah. Health bar dot text. Oh, right there. Right there. Please work. Please work. Oh my goodness. Uh, you really need a spell checker in these things. You are the spell checker. Okay, so game state dot player dot health. Four to five. Game state dot player dot health bar dot text equals HP value of game state dot player dot health. That goes to there, that goes to there, that wraps up with this one, which is good. New state I compare dot health. Greater than zero. Where's the life counter? Let me see what that is. I think I might have. Yeah. Game state dot life counter. This dot add dot text. Game state dot player dot lives. Style. <sighs> okay. I'm just seeing if that did anything. That's just a variable recreated as an example. Um, is anything broken down here? Anything in our logic? That's the defend button. Where's this one going? Right. Okay. And is equal to one. This all so this all was working before, so I don't think it has anything to do with our button logic. Um, that's just what we've added since then. Bummer, bummer. Okay. Uh, yeah. Wave count player. I'm gonna just start deleting things and see when it pops back up. So let's start from the bottom um, and just delete it line by line and save it and see if it runs. Yep, I'm gonna just delete all that. Okay, so it wasn't that entire block. Grab this portion of it, like that. Okay, I don't understand that. Like, why doesn't it like the the and that we put in there? Let's oh, let's oh, okay. First of all, let's put that back and see if that yeah, it's still broken. It really does not like this. Game state dot player dot lives equals zero. So I don't know why it does it doesn't like that because that's. A perfectly fine conditional. It says that and this is less than or this is equal to zero. I don't know. That's weird. It should check that and say that it's not that and then say that okay so if it's not that then don't do this. Um, 
but also I want to go back to what I had here. Yeah, and spell that correctly. There we go. So then just delete this, right? Just delete this part. And it's fine. And it's totally fine. And then we have our life points that why? Why is why does it not like that? Because in this statement, this says that if it's equal to less than or equal to zero and the lives are greater than zero. This is literally the same, except we're saying if lives is equal to. Oh, because we assigned it and we didn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't say is equal to. This is the issue. And it had three equal signs instead of, well, we had one equal sign instead of three, which is trying to assign the value of game state .player lives to zero. And that doesn't make sense as a conditional. Why would you, like, you can't assign something inside of the conditional check so anyway now that's that's working and everything's fine we're all happy we're dance we're doing our tap dance we're doing our tap dance all right lp yes we got that going hp 45 now when we attack let's do the worst strategy right the worst strategy was like special attack yeah protect thunderbolt owl has fainted red owl appears red owl loses loses one loses four okay special attack is actually pretty good let's defend i think defense is like the worst with what we set up with our game logic. So we can't, we literally cannot hurt the other player. There we go, yes, okay, so it worked. So after we we went down to zero, it clicked over. The lives were equal to two now. Let's just keep defending until we lose completely. And <laughs> the enemy's HP, just like 92, he just keeps defending. Dude, defeat me. Come on, come on, bro, defeat me. It's fun. All right, defeat me, Blue Owl. Why can you not defeat me? You have a hundred. You have two hundred lives or two hundred hit points. Okay, let's try the special attack. Special. Yeah, special attack definitely is also the most risky too. You lose so much, but I think our enemy is. Yeah, there we go. Going. See what happens when we reach to zero. Yet. Yes. Okay. Cool. So once the lives equal zero, then the final conditional. And the final condition is met, and we end the game scene, start the end scene, and since our lives are at zero, we show the you lost end screen. Sweet, so all that's working. I think the only thing that we have left to do is to create the logic that determines, or no, we did the move accuracy. All right, create another move that the computer can do, that the player and the computer can do, special defense. Okay, so this as far as the logic goes is pretty simple where we would add in um basically add in a special defense button right and have it be we could just call it special defense button and then copy this code for that so we do game state dot special defense button dot on pointer up and then have everything be symmetrical um have the same functionality as all of our other buttons and then we would change the results based on the random moves that the computer chooses to do um, with that extra button we would go back through and change this math.random number to be multiplied by four since there are now four options for the computer um, and then just program in the result for each of those um, but what I'm curious about, that's more of the, the straightforward thing, what we did for each of the buttons. We just do again for the special defense button. The only additional thing would be actually adding uh, the words here, the code at the top line to, to initialize the, um, the click. So let's see how we add in, how we actually populate another button on screen. Um, so one thing I want to do, I want to see where this is, where this is initialized, the special button. Let's check that. Okay, yeah, so it's up here. <clears throat> up here. Yeah, as you can see, like, for this, they, that's why. That's why they're all set vertically, because they are, their x-coordinates are the same. Um, let's go ahead and keep... Let's move the attack down, first of all. Let's move the attack down and to the left. So you want to do like 45 and uh, 150. Let's 
do this one as the defend button. Let's say it's also 150. Um, and let's just see how that looks for the moment. Oh, whoa. Okay. <laughs> okay, so 45. So attack is a little too far over to the left and it's way too high. So so the increase in Y is actually moving the, the items, the sprites down. So we want this to be maybe 100 and then set this to be 250. But hey, look at that. We found out where um, the coordinates for these were based on uh, tracking down where the button logic was referenced, where it was first initialized. So let's do that as 100 and 250. See what that does. That's going to put it like right over the mouse. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. I am attack mouse. I am attack mouse. Okay. Uh, let's make that five, 550. It's going to put it down where special attack sort of is. Let's do 525 and then put it in the same line as that. Um, defense, let's also put this at 525. Have this be at 150 maybe? 150 or 200. See what that does. Okay, that's a little bit too close to it. Let's make 250. And then move the special attack over more to be um, like four or 500. Or no, let's see, 150. So just add 150 to that. So uh, 400. Let's see. Okay, cool. Uh, this is, you know, it's not quite centered, but whatever. I mean, um, we're gonna try to make this so that it's like butted, butted up against the attack. Yeah, so then we can add in our special defense thing. Um, so then make this 300. It's gonna be 100 pixels apart for each special attack. And now the magic happens. So game state dot special. Uh, not special button. We want this to be um, special defense. Special, uh, like, yeah, just, I don't know. It'll be a longer name, but we'll just put that in. Special defense. Defense button. You don't even have to name it button, but that just helps you understand what that is later. This is going to equal this dot add dot sprite. And I'm guessing, actually, I think I saw it up here, um, that they added in a sprite named, where was it? Was it there? Background, defend, special. No, I guess not. I guess not. Okay. They didn't add a sprite in for us, so we'll see if we can actually do this. Um, where are these? Where are these referenced? Where are the attack sprites referenced? Cat attack, this is going to go through all the players. Load image of attack. Um... Oh, damage is special. So I don't think they gave us a special defense um, sprite. So let's see what happens when we just do, we say this is at 400, this is at 525, and um, special. So then we'll have two, two special attacks. What happens when we do... Hmm. I guess we can't really change, because they're, they're just PNG images, right? What we could do is just say this add text, right? And then just have that be a button. Um, like this add text, but we want the the only issue with this is like, yeah, we could type in whatever we want, but then we would want the whole box to be clickable, which is the point of doing a sprite. Instead, you create a box and then that whole box is is clickable. Instead, with this method of doing just the text, you'd have to click like the, the exact p 
pixel that the text is on. Um, so let's just keep that as special. We'll know that the second one is is a special defense. They didn't give us that. Um, so this button on the right is going to be our special defense button. Now, um, let's first of all copy copy this, right? Because we're running, going to want to add this down underneath the special attack and sort of memorize this um, yeah, this beginning here. Actually, you know what we can do? Is just take the special button. Um, copy literally everything inside of here. Make a duplicate. And then change this at the top to be defense, right? And what that will do, even though we have literally changed nothing except uh, copied all of the code, and, and change the name of this. Now that button over there is going to be, nope, prove me wrong. Um, special defense button on, is that the same? Yeah, it says special, so that should be, hmm, maybe there's another area that I need to add that in, let's see, special attack, special attack still works, yeah, special Hmm. <laughs> so where does this go? Actually, maybe, uh, let me make sure. Let me make sure that this is connected. All of that's connected. It's not throwing a reference error, but special button on see where that is in the line of things here special button equals this add sprite yeah the sprite one that's it there's just two oh i missed something set interactive that is especially important no pun intended so we need to do set interactive and again they haven't walked us through what that is but pretty self-explanatory that makes it so that you can click it that makes the button clickable now when we go and we click this one, we can click either one of these and it will be our special attack. And uh, yeah, cool. Both have functionality. That's how you add in another button. And then from there, you could you could change the health to be um, like when you, you could change the logic to be the same as the defense, but have it be extra special when you actually um, defend and the computer defends, then you gain like 10 instead of five, right? Um, just double double the health benefit there. In fact, we'll do that. We'll go ahead and add the defense logic to our new special button. Um, let's grab all of this. Guess we don't, yeah, we can just do like the last two there. Um, or the last three, yeah, the last three, but whatever, we'll, 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 we'll make it work. Special defense, let us do this, let's get rid of all of that, and then add in our defense logic. Okay, so now this works like a de defending move, but when the computer also defends, you get 10 or say you get like 20, I guess. I don't know. It's like super, super good. You get like 20. 15, maybe. Let's not be crazy here. 15. Okay, so now, let's see if we can trigger that. Um, defense curl. And maybe you could just change this line to be like super defense curl. And that way you know the difference between the special defense and the special attack. Or sorry, the special defense and the normal defense. Let's try this again. Super defense curl, yeah. Um, let's also say, like, you don't lose anything if... Yeah. Yeah, so just, like, eliminate all of this. You don't lose anything if the player attacks. And then, yeah, okay. And then the computer loses, like, three... <laughs> 
right? So there's literally no way to lose. You just do the special defense or the super defense girl. This is one of those moves is like it only has like five power points, right? Um, yeah, it loses like three, three health on that. Okay, let's try that now. Now we cannot lose. The tumbleweed floats by. Wait, the tumbleweed floats by did not work. That did not work how I expected. That should increase the HP. What are we doing here? What is off? Um, oh, because it didn't update. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, so it didn't actually update the health. Health bar. Um, we're not named at defend. We need our health bars here. Right. One line above. Keep the animations together. We need our health bars to pop in like so and update that. Um, we also need the one for our player. These also need to be copied into the regular defense because apparently we didn't have those there. Um, so let's just copy those into... No, that is, put that at the top line. Put this at the top line. Oh boy. Let's delete this. Clean up our code. So now we have the health bars together. We have the animations together. We just need to copy these health bar updates to our defense button and then i think we will be all finished special button we want to go to the defense button yeah right here okay now we do this again yeah there we go of course it only added five but that's okay uh it's kind of strange Tumbleweed floats by. Why does that do 5 instead of 15? Protect a tumbleweed floats by. Game state dot player to health. Oh, because I added the computer the computer health I, I gave him. I gave him more. We don't want that. I mean, that that is interesting. Like, you do the super defense curl if you defend yourself more. The only downside is that the computer could get more health. So I guess that makes it more fair. But we're going to make it broken and do 15. Um, now when we heal and the computer heals at the same time, we get 15 points. Yeah, and then just defend. This is the broken button. You just super defense curl. <laughs> super defense curl. And no matter what he does, he either loses or gains just a little bit. But he never inflicts damage on the electric mouse. Because we are effectively invincible. Now we'll do our special attack. Thunderbolt! Until we face the psychic hairless cat. There it is. The freaky monstrosity. That can use aerial ace because it can fly. There we go. We're done and we won! Woohoo! Cool. Cool, cool. Alright, well that is Electric Mouse. That is all that I was planning to do for today on Code Academy. Cool. That felt a lot better than the uh, the cube matching game <laughs> that I tried before. That one was a huge struggle. It was like an hour of trying to find uh, the syntax error. But anyway, we have done it. So thank you all for following along or tuning in. I hope this was enjoyable and educational in some ways. Um, relatively straightforward. Basically a lot of copying and pasting uh, once we had the you know, the main logic understood. Um, but then after that, we had some fun with the extra lives and adding buttons and all. I think, let me see, let me go ahead and save this. We'll, we'll see what they've got next for us. And we'll call it quits for today. Where was the one? There was one like, okay, that's the one that I didn't check off. Oh yeah, so after every, um, every game dev project they have, they give you the solution for it. Um, but they do say that even if your solution, their solution does not look like what yours is, it's fine as long as yours is functional. As long as it works. If it works, it works. <clears throat> All right, what are we doing the next time? Phaser Basics, we are finally getting into Phaser itself. We've been dabbling in it uh, through the game dev projects. We've been seeing um, how it helps build um, 
build, it's like a scaffolding, right? It helps build the project that you're working on a little bit faster. All right, so we'll be diving into the world of Phaser next time. But for today, I will say good day to you, wherever you are in the world. And live long and prosper, everyone. See ya.